Well, you have picked a good Sunday to be here at North Grand because today is our mission emphasis day, and it's kind of a, a special day that we uh, kind of focus in on our missions. And I know the uh, missions committee has worked really hard on setting us up. If you are part of the missions committee, could you raise your hand? Yeah, we appreciate you. I had the 9 o'clock service do the same thing. There was a group of you from that as well. I know a lot of you have uh, worked really hard, and uh, I know some of you have actually attended the prayer walk in the other building, so we're excited, and hopefully you did get the chance to do that, because that's just a time when you can walk through and begin to pray for specific missions that we support here at North Grand. And um, as Martin shared earlier, um, John Woodward is here with us. Now, John has uh, is not really a guest. He's more like family, because he's been such a huge part of this church over many, many years, and so we appreciate both John and Gwen being here. Plus, they have a little bit of an incentive with their family being here as well, Lissy and Daniel and Noah and Lissy, uh, Lily, Lily as well, and uh, so it's kind of fun for them to come and hang out together as well. I'm going to invite John to come up, and Lissy, I believe, is going to be reading scripture uh, for John today as well. Uh, one of the kind of ironic things uh, was last year John came and shared, and it was actually the third Sunday, I believe, in September that John was here, which is kind of ironic. Um, and John preached on something. So I want to test you guys and see if you remember. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I don't remember what I preached the last time I was up here. So uh, let's see if you guys um, can remember what he preached about. Any, any, anybody want to take a wild guess what John Missions? Okay. It would make sense, right? He's a missionary. That's ex that's, right, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it could have been a good answer as well. Well, actually, what John preached on last year was prayer walking. And isn't it ironic that this year, when John comes back, we're actually having a prayer walk? I told John that's because we listen to him preach. That's the reason why, right? So, but in any case, uh, we're glad to have John with us. Lissy's going to read the word. We're going to ask the blessing uh, God's blessing on the message as well as the word today. Gracious Father, we just thank you so much for just the time we get to have, uh, Father, in, in your word. Uh, thank you for John being the deliverer of it today, Lord. And uh, Father, we ask that you would bless him as he shares with us. Father, I pray for our hearts to be open because, um, Father, it, it, this is a message that would speak to each and every one of us in the room. And uh, Father, uh, not only do we want to celebrate what you're doing in missions around the world, but we also want to realize that, Father, we too have a mission here as well. And I pray that you um, speak to our hearts today as John comes and shares. We thank you for it, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First uh, Kings 17, 1 through 16. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain for the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here and turn eastward to hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and you will drink from the brook that I have ordered. You will drink from a brook, and I have ordered ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zareph of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he got to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, Anne, bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And I am gathering a few sticks to take home and to make a meal for myself and my son that we, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. 
Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. And she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not turn dry, in keeping with the word the Lord had spoken by Elijah. See? So that's a great missionary passage. So thank you very much for allowing me to come and share with you this morning. It's always a joy to come back and, and be with you. And especially during a missions Sunday, I uh, appreciate the church and your support for the mission work that we do over in the South Pacific. And in fact, a week from today, I'll be landing in Sydney, Australia, being able to get back to visit our workers overseas for the first time in three years, which I'm so uh, excited about, but I'm glad to be with you here this morning. Um, and in light of Mission Sunday, I'd like to give you a new definition of a missionary, and this is from my own experience and from talking with lots of missionaries, and that definition of a missionary is someone who goes to places where they probably really don't want to be to do the work of the Lord, okay? Missionaries are oftentimes called to go to places that are really difficult, really hard. Oftentimes, it's not the really place they really want to be, and those are the places they go to do work. And I can guarantee you that as they go and work in those places, those are the places they have an opportunity to see God work the most because they're open up their lives to allow God to work in those places where they don't want to be. Well, this morning, I really would like to challenge you um, about what it means to go into places where we don't want to have to be. And the reason I want to challenge you to go to places you may not want to be is because that allows us space for God to work in your life. It is in places where we're most uncomfortable, maybe out of our comfort zone, that if we go to those places, that God shows up and God does the most work. And so this morning, I'd like to share with you about a story in which I was in a place where I really did not want to be. And this uh, was a time where I got to see God at work as well. So many of you know that Gwen and I worked over in Eastern Europe back shortly after we were married and shortly before we came to North Grand. And on one of our trips to Eastern Europe, uh, we got to take a number of Gospels of John in the Slovakian language into the church uh, in Czechoslovakia. Now, I have to tell you, crossing borders with Bibles and Christian literature is not a necessarily fun thing to do. In fact, it's very nerve-wracking. And it really is a place where uh, most of us really don't want to be. And so let me give you a little bit of background of what we were doing on this trip and what you need to know about taking Bibles into communist countries. So I think we had five rules that we followed when we took material into communist countries. The first rule was that we prayed. Okay? As good missionaries, you'd think that might be an important rule to do, right? So we prayed a lot before we crossed these borders because we knew the communist countries did not want us to bring Bibles into the churches. And so second rule was that you packed all the material that you were trying to get in into one suitcase. And the idea was you packed several suitcases, but you put everything in one suitcase because if you scattered it around, wherever the guards were looking, they'd probably find it. But if you put it in one suitcase, there was a, like one in four chance that they would check that particular suitcase. So you put everything in one place. Okay? Rule number three, if you pray, okay, this is hard work, and it's kind of scary work to do to take Bibles and literature across communist borders, and so you prayed a lot. Now, the fourth rule was that you did not help the border guards. Okay? You did nothing to go above and beyond the call of duty. You did exactly what the border guards told you to do, and so you followed their instructions, and you just did that, and we'll see how that works in a minute. And then the fifth rule, any guess? Hope you guys are good. Um, so yeah, pray. And the reason we prayed is because of the fact that taking material and into communist countries and crossing borders like this, you are putting yourself in a position where essentially you're out of your control. Uh, you really couldn't do anything when you're standing there on the border except to pray. You had to rely on God 
And the prayer that we often prayed was, Lord, keep seeing eyes blind. Uh, do not let the guards see the material we were bringing in so we could get it to the suffering churches in Eastern Europe. And so um, you drive up to the border, and it's kind of intimidating because there's barbed wire and there's guard dogs and guys with machine guns. And you pull up to the border, and the first thing you do is get out of your car and you fill out all this paperwork. Communists love paperwork. And so you fill out all this paperwork, and then you exchange money. Then you got back in your car, and then this is where it gets really hard because you sat in your car, and you were in a long line of cars, and it may take an hour or two or longer as you watch cars in front of you, each one, one at a time, getting inspected. And you knew your time was coming when your car was going to get inspected too. And so as we get closer, your heart starts pounding, you start sweating, and because you know you have material in the trunk that you're not supposed to have, and as you got closer, you prayed harder. And so we finally pulled up to the point where we're going to be inspected, and you just park, and you sit, and you wait. And finally, a guard came out, and it was obvious very quickly that he didn't speak English because he did everything with hand signals. And so he walked around the car, kind of looked inside, looked in the uh, passenger seat to see if there's anything suspicious looking. And then he walked around to my window on the driver's side and tapped on my window. And then he indicated for me to get out. So I get out, shut the door, and I stand there. And I wait for my next instruction. And so he walks around to the trunk, and he taps on the trunk and indicates to open it. And so I walk around to the trunk, open the trunk, and lift up the trunk. Now, as we're getting closer, you can imagine I'm getting a little more nervous because it's getting closer to all that material, and we could get into big trouble for doing this. And so uh, I'm getting very nervous and praying very, very hard. And so he leans in and kind of moves things around just to see what's in the trunk. And then he stands back, and then he points into the trunk. And you'll never guess what he pointed at. He pointed at the suitcase with all the material. And again, my heart sank to the floor. And I, I'm being the very clever missionary that I was at the time. I pointed at another suitcase and smiled and said, this one? And he shook his head and went, nope, pointed again at the suitcase. So at that point, he indicated for me to take that suitcase out. And so I had to take the suitcase out and take it over and put it on a bench. And I knew in the next few moments, he was going to have me open that suitcase and was going to find all that material. And at this point, I was in a place where I really did not want to be. And why didn't I want to be there? Well, it was because there was nothing I could do. I was totally helpless. I had to completely rely on God at that moment because there was nothing I could do. And frankly, those are the places I think most of us really don't want to be. We don't want to be in a place where we're out of our control, where we have to trust in God, and we have to allow God to do his work at that time. And so my question for you this morning is this. Have you ever been in a place like that, in a place where you had no other choice but to completely rely on God, where you had to trust him to come through and show up? And if not, why not? I think a lot of it, for most of us, is we avoid places where we don't want to be, where we have to rely completely on God. Well, the passage we're going to look at today is about a prophet who also had to go to a place where he really didn't want to be, but in that place where he had to rely completely on God, he got to see God's faithfulness, his trustworthiness, and the fact that God can uh, provide. So let me give you a little background. Uh, at the beginning of our chapter, we find out that Ahab had become king, and you learn about that in chapter 16, and Ahab was probably one of the worst kings of Israel. Uh, he was really bad. In fact, uh, in chapter 16, it says he did more to anger the Lord. And so it seemed like he went out of his way to get on God's bad side. And one of the worst things he did was he was allowing idols and um, other gods to come in and be worshipped by the people of Israel. So uh, Baal and Asherah were, were being worshipped by the people of Israel, which God was not very happy about. And so at the point at the uh, beginning of verse, or chapter 17, God was going to do something to help Ahab understand that the Lord God of Israel lived, as the prophet said in verse 1. In other words, that God is alive, God is real, you need to pay attention to what God has to say. And in order for Ahab to wake up, God said he was going to bring a drought, not just like a year-long drought, but this was going to be a drought that was going to last for several years. 
Now, dear Elijah had the wonderful uh, opportunity to go into the king and be able to tell the king, in fact, that his life was going to get pretty miserable for the next few years. And I assure you, that is something Elijah probably did not want to have to do. But he went in and told the king, and as he left the king, God gives Elijah some important instructions. And what he was asked to do was going to give him opportunity to learn about God's trustworthiness and God's provision in his life. So let's take a look at two lessons we're going to learn that Elijah learned from his following the instructions of God. The first lesson is this. God provides when we are most hopeless and helpless. In verse 3 and 4, Elijah is told to go east. Now, the idea was to get away from Ahab, so going east was probably a good idea. But what is east of Israel? Well, you cross over the Jordan, and you go into basically the desert. So here, God is saying there's going to be this horrible drought that's going to come across the entire land, and in order for you to survive, I'm sending you to an even more desolate place that's already under a drought, which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And I'm sure Elijah's going, this is ridiculous. Why go to this place where there's little chance of surviving? But God gives him some promises. In verse 4, God says, I will provide. And there's two ways he's going to provide. The first one, he says, I will lead you to a brook. And there's going to be plenty of water. So throughout this entire drought, you're going to have water to drink until you're instructed to go elsewhere. And so there's going to be water for you. You don't have to worry about that. And then he says, I will direct ravens to bring food for you. Okay, this is a little bizarre when you think about it. Okay, God says, I'm going to send birds that are going to provide food for you. And they're going to bring meat and bread. And they're going to bring it every day, morning and evening. Okay, that's kind of a weird thing. And I, I thought about this a little bit. I read through it very quickly. And, and I thought, okay, ravens are good with coming up with meat, right? Because they eat off of roadkill. And so they probably could find some meat somewhere. But in the desert, in a drought, it's going to be really hard to find anything, but let alone being fed by roadkill. Poor Elijah. I'm not sure that would be a real appetizing way to go. But then all of a sudden it hit me that the passage said that the ravens were going to supply bread. Okay? Um, I can understand if the ravens brought, like, plants or seeds, but bread needs a person, people, to make, right? So where in the world, in the middle of a desert, in the middle of a drought, are ravens going to find a bakery where they can come up with bread to supply Elijah all his needs? Okay? Ravens don't make bread, so how in the world are ravens going to come up with bread? Okay, so something miraculous is going to have to happen here. And so what Elijah was be basically being asked to do is this. He was being asked to trust in God. To trust in God, because this is something so out there that you would have to completely trust in God in order to follow his instructions. And so how did Elijah respond? Well, it says in verse 5 that he did what the Lord had told him to do. In other words, Elijah had walked into the desert knowing this was going to be a place where he was going to be helpless, where he had no provisions, where he was going to have to completely trust in God just to survive. But he was willing to step out in faith and do that and allow God to show up and take care of his needs. And what did Elijah learn? Well, God showed up. And so for the next period of time, every day, ravens came with bread and meat, morning and evening, and he had plenty to drink. And so Elijah survived, and he saw God at work in a way that was really miraculous, but he realized that indeed God could provide. So Elijah had to go into a desolate, awful place where he had no control in order to allow God to show him that he was powerful and faithful, and trustworthy, and that God could actually provide. So what about you and me? Um, when was the last time we were in a place where we were vulnerable, where we had no control, where we had to truly trust in God and allow God to show up? You see, I think the problem we have for most of us here in the United States, um, we are very good about securing our lives. 
we're very good about ordering our lives and organizing our lives that we really don't have any need. And it's because we don't have any need, we really don't have to rely on God. And so we don't ever get to really see God show up. So Elijah had to go into a desert, into a desolate place, to see God at work. And maybe you and I need to think about maybe stepping out a little bit more in faith, stepping out and taking risks, in a, being in a place where we have to rely on God, and then we'll have opportunity like Elijah to see God provide and God show up. Now, the second lesson he learned is this. God provides through unlikely sources. You see, I think this underlying message here that God chooses very strange ways of providing for his prophets. And we've already seen ravens. I mean, again, birds showing up to feed the prophet is not your ordinary, everyday situation. But Elijah's going to also have to rely on another very unlikely and very strange source. And we see that beginning in verse 7 through 9. Because at this point, the brook dries up in the desert. And so now God says, we're going on to plan B. And since there's no more water out here, I'm going to send you into the city. And when you get into the city, I'm going to send you to a woman. And this woman is going to be directed to take care of your needs. Now, stop and think about this. And, and think about this woman that God is directing Elijah to. Because this is just not a poor woman. This is a woman who is on her last leg. I mean, she is totally desperate. And if you look at verse 12, and I love this because it really sends her heart and where she's at in life. Because as she is confronted by Elijah, this is what he, she says to him. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that I may eat it and die. Okay? This should break your heart. I mean, what Elijah was being asked to is to go to this widow who believed that she and her son were having their last meal and they were going to die. They, they had nothing left. They had nothing to offer. They couldn't make it on their own. They were going to die. This is the end. And this is the widow that God directed Elijah to, to feed him. Uh, I'm sure Elijah was going, okay, wait a second, God. Uh, really? <laughs> you want me to go to this poor widow and have her feed me when she can't even feed herself and her son? Uh, I mean, God, come on, don't you have like a rich dude somewhere who has lots of money, uh, lots of storehouses that can provide for me through the rest of this drought? And so I'm sure Elijah was like, this is not a place I want to be. I don't have, want to have to go and ask this woman to help me. But God speaks through Elijah and gives some promises. But it's only going to get a little bit worse because what Elijah is also going to have to do is ask this woman to step out in faith. In the same way God had asked Elijah to step out in faith by going out into the desert and trust him, he was going to ask this widow to step out in faith, to provide for the prophet and trust that God was somehow going to meet all her needs through the rest of the drought. And so that was a big ask for this woman, to have to step out in faith, to give up what little she had. Because what Elijah does is he goes to this widow, and he says to her, bake me some bread. And we know that this widow thinks that all she has left is enough to feed her and her son their last meal. And what she's being asked is to give that last meal to Elijah, but then Elijah gives this promise from God because in verse 14 it says, the jar of flour will not be used up and oil will not run dry till the day the Lord ends or brings rain. In other words, she was being asked to trust that God was going to somehow provide for all her needs if she was willing to sacrifice what little she had. And I think this is a really important biblical principle that when we are willing to sacrifice what little we have, for someone else, God always returns that blessing. It always comes back to us a hundredfold. And so this woman was being asked in her desperate situation to give up what little she had and trust that God was somehow going to provide for her going forward. And what we find out is that this woman, in spite of being in this place she really didn't want to be, was willing to do that. 
gave to Elijah what little she had, and she saw God provide for all the days of that drought, and she never needed anything because God provided for her. So the question I have is this. Why did God choose these unlikely sources to provide? Okay, stop and think about this. I mean, God is choosing these very abnormal and, and people in a place where really they could not do anything and using them to supply the needs of the prophet. Well, we know, you know, birds don't make bread and we know poor widows don't have endless resources. And so therefore, why did God choose this woman and these ravens to supply the needs of the prophet? Well, I think it's obviously clear. It's because it shows that really it was God who's at work. It, it was God who is supplying the need. It was God working through these people because they themselves could not do it on their own. Again, ravens could not come up with all this bread or baked bread, and this widow could not come up with all the resources to take care of the prophet. So obviously it was God working through these people. And because it was God at work, clearly, then God gets the credit. God gets the glory. These people got to see God show up. And so the question I have for us this morning is, what do we have in our lives that we can fully give credit to God for? I mean, most of us, we can credit our bank account, our good education, our good job. Uh, we have a hundred places that we can say, yeah, I took care of these things and this is why I have everything I have. But what do we have in life that we can actually say, this is all because of God. That God provided in my time of need. That God showed up. What can we credit to God completely? And so this woman had the opportunity to see God show up. And, and what a joy that must have been for her to be able to tell people years later that God worked through her and provided her need, and she was able then to help meet the need of a prophet. So she could give glory to God for the great things that she had done through his, her life. And so the question is, is when have we ever seen God really show up to see God really provide for us? And the reason we don't ever have opportunity to see that is because we never make room and never are vulnerable and allow God to do those things for us in our lives. And folks, I think that's one of the joys of doing mission work. And I've talked to lots of missionaries over the years. I think just being a missionary is being in a position where you are having to trust God to show up. You're making room for God to work because most missionaries I know do go to places and do work that is really hard in places they don't want to necessarily be, but they're called by God to go. And I think just raising support for missionaries, they get to see God supply their needs every single day by providing for them in ways that surprise them and in ways that they have no idea where it's coming from until God supplies. Uh, I'd like to share a story with you about how God showed up through a un very unlikely source that provided and helped us with a need uh, with our Lakota camps a few years ago, and I think it's a great illustration of what I'm talking about. Um, a few years ago, when I left For God's Children, um, I still kept in touch with the Lakota kids up on the reservation because uh, I just love them and I want to continue to uh, pour love into them. And so the year I left, um, the uh, Four God's Children did not do a camp for the teenagers. They did some for the little kids, but for some reason they didn't do any for the teenagers. And so when I was up visiting the Lakota Reservation and talking with some of the kids, the teenagers came up to me and said, John, we are so upset that we didn't have a camp this year. It just broke our heart. We miss camp. And I went to them you really do like this camp, don't you? And they go, oh yeah, we love going to camp and, and I, please make sure we have a camp next year. And for me, it was like, okay, if these kids want to come to camp and have an opportunity to pour Jesus into them, by golly, I'm going to do whatever I can to do a camp. So I went to Four God's Children and said, um, I would like to volunteer to run your teenage camp next year to make sure we have that. And so um, I said, I will take care of coming up with staff, I'll recruit the kids, I'll come up with uh, cooks, do the transportation, do everything uh, as long as we can do the camp. And they were really happy that I was going to do that. And so we got it all organized over the next few months, contacted the kids, and they're all excited about coming to camp. And then about four weeks out before the camp, I went out 
to the camp to talk to the director and share what we were going to do and also talk to the director of the mission. And after sharing everything that we had all set up, the director of the mission turned to me and said, uh, so how are you going to pay for this? <laughs> I was like, um, uh, uh, I don't know. Because <laughs> I thought that I was helping them to do their Lakota camp and that that was part of their mission. And in fact, he said, well, no, we don't have any money, so if you want to do the camp, you're going to have to come up with the money. Well, I didn't have you know, several thousand dollars to run a Lakota camp, and I didn't know where money would come from. And so I went to our staff and said, look, here's the situation. I don't know if we're going to have camp because I don't have money to do this, and we need to pray about it. And so, again, at this point, I was in a helpless situation. Um, did not know what was going to happen, and in fact, I had no idea that God already had someone all set that was going to help us out. And the way that happened, I think, really shows how God shows up. Because about three days after this conversation at the camp where I discovered we needed to come up with all this money, uh, I happened to be uh, scheduled to preach at the Griswold Church here in Iowa. And so I preached that Sunday, and after church, a gentleman came up to me and said, hi, do you remember me? And I, I always feel bad because I go to lots of churches and I've met lots of people, and there's a lot of people I don't remember meeting. I say, sorry, I really don't. And he said, well, my name's Kenny, and I was one of the youth sponsors on a mission trip that you took our youth group on up to the Indian Reservation a few years earlier. And we got talking, and he said that was such a great trip, and he has still had a real concern for the Lakota kids, and, and he asked me if I was still involved with the kids. Well, that gave me the opportunity to share with him the fact that, yeah, I was involved and tried to do anything I could for these kids, but... Uh, we wanted to have a camp, and we were told that we had to pay for it, and we don't have the money. And so I said, we looks like we're not going to have a camp. Well, we talked for a few minutes more, and then at the end of the conversation, we went our separate ways. And I didn't really think anything about that conversation. The next morning, I opened up my email, and there was an email from Kenny. And the email basically said, I would love to cover the cost of the Lakota camp. And so... God provided. Uh, God provided through someone that I didn't even know was out there a, two, a day earlier, and God provided in an amazing way that we were able to have our Lakota camp. And in fact, we've done about four years of Lakota camp for the teens, and God has supplied all our needs every year for those camps. And so God always provides. God shows up in amazing and unexpected ways. And so when we step out in faith, that's when we get to see God showing up and doing some amazing things in very unexpected ways. So I really believe that God wants to show up in your life. See, God wants you to know that he's alive, that he's real, and he wants to make a difference in your life. And again, I love what the prophet says. He says, the Lord God of Israel lives. And so he wants you to know that he lives. And the only way we're really going to see him live is if we open up space in our lives to allow God to do some work in our life. And so the question I have for you this morning is, how often have you put yourself in a place where you really don't want to be, where you've allowed God to work? And if you haven't, then maybe you need to step into places where you don't necessarily want to be. And so I left you in the middle of Czechoslovakia wondering if, I'm going to get in with all these Bibles and materials. And so I'd like to finish the story because I think it illustrates what I've been talking about. Because I'm in a place where I don't want to be. Um, I'm standing with a guard and a suitcase full of Gospels of John, and it's like, uh, Lord, you're going to have to do something because it's out of my control. And so I'm praying, I'm sweating. I wish I had faith that I wasn't sweating, but um, I'm sweating, and the guard then indicates for me to open up the suitcase. And thankfully, this is like 40 years ago for those old people like me. Um, you remember the suitcases that had flaps on each side? So when I opened the suitcases, you didn't see anything. And Gwen had done a great job of covering up the material underneath those flaps so you wouldn't see it right away. So the guard says, open up the suitcase, and I open up the suitcase. Then he indicates for me to open up one of the flaps. And every moment I'm getting closer to that material, my heart's pounding harder and it's like, Lord, please keep seeing eyes blind. So I open up the flap, 
And instantly, you don't see anything except the robe or something over that, uh, the material. But there's hundreds of Gospels of John right there. And then the guard leans over and then picks up a corner of that robe and looks underneath. And I mean, all the material's right there. I'm just going, okay, Lord, please, please. And he looks, pauses for a moment, and then puts it back down. And then to my surprise, he indicates for me to put the flap back over. And I'm just kind of very confused at that point, but I do it very quickly. And then he points at the other side. And so again, I'm praying really hard, and I open up the other side, open up the flap, and again, he doesn't see anything instantly, but then he does again, this leaning over, picking up the corner, and looking underneath. And again, hundreds of the Gospel of John right there under his hand. And he looks, and to my surprise, he puts it back down and indicates for me to close up the flap, close up the suitcase, and put the suitcase in the car. You have never seen a person close a suitcase and put it in the car faster than I did at that moment. Toss it in the car, and as I'm driving away from that border with all those Gospels of John, I am worshiping God. And the reason is, is because God showed up. God had answered my prayers and kept being eyes blind. And because I had been in a place where I really did not want to be, I got to see God at work. And I have a deeper faith because I know God lives and God can do things like that. And so my question to you this morning is this. Do you have your life so secure, so organized, so well taken care of that you really have not given room for God to work? I mean, have you taken care of everything so well that you've really never seen God show up? So when was the last time you really stepped out in faith? When was the last time you put yourself in a position where you're out of your control, where maybe you're vulnerable and where you had to completely trust in God? So when we, have you ever really had to completely put your faith and trust in him? So I really don't care where you are in your walk with Christ. Um, I think all of us, no matter how mature we are in our walk with Christ, we all need to see more of God. We need to see that God does show up. And I am convinced that it's only when we are willing to take steps of faith that we create room for God to show up. So maybe we need to take a step of faith. Maybe it's going on a mission trip that you've been avoiding because you think you'll be uncomfortable. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, reaching out to a neighbor about Jesus. Maybe it's doing something here in the church that you've been asked to do, but you say, well, it's kind of out of my comfort zone. Or maybe it's uh, going to the inner city or working with refugees, with people who aren't like you. And I can guarantee each one of those situations may make you uncomfortable, maybe out of your comfort zone, maybe a step of faith. But I can guarantee if you're willing to do that, God's going to show up. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I'm so grateful for Elijah. And I'm so grateful, Father, that he was willing to step out in faith, to step out into that desert. And we know, Father, that because he was willing to do that, he saw you work in some amazing ways. And Father, you are God who still works in amazing ways. And I just pray, Father, that you would help us understand that as long as our lives are so secure and so comfortable, we're never going to have opportunity to allow you to really do the work and show up in the way that you want to. I just pray, Father, for this church, for the people here, that you would encourage them to be people that are willing to step out in faith and to do something new and different and to put their trust in you and give you opportunity to show them indeed, Father, that you can provide, that you are trustworthy, and that you are alive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.